Hello, my name is Barbara Preinsack. I'm one of the co-authors of this new paper on collaborative comparisons that has come out in Social Science and Medicine Qualitative Research in Health. And I'm very happy to introduce Henrik Wachner and Katharina Kieslich to you, who will tell you why we are excited about this paper, and we hope you will be as well. Um, yeah, we're just here today to have a little chat about our methods paper. And for those of you watching this little video, our methods paper is a very exciting paper because um, it emerged from our project that we've been working on the last two years. Um, the project um, is called Solidarity in Times of a Pandemic, led by uh, Baba Preinsack at the oh. University of Vienna. And um, it's actually a 10 country qualitative comparative study, um, which as far as we know is pretty unique. Um, and so we took the opportunity together with our co-authors, um, Tina Zimmermann and Nora Hangen and Baba Preinsack to yeah, really reflect upon some of the challenges we encountered um, along the way, but also some of the innovation um, that we feel we undertook um, in this project, um, especially also as, um, in the realm of methods. Um, so over to you, Hank. Could you um, explain again um, what this paper is about? Well, that's a good question, because when I wrote the abstract, I thought, oh, this is a big paper with <laughs> it goes in different directions. But very briefly, um, it's we engaged in a in a large scale uh, multi-country qualitative research project, and um, large scale is really large scale. So you already mentioned ten countries, but uh, we have a total of eight hundred and four interviews. So qualitative research, as I was taught, uh, you know, was, is, is you do some interviews, you do uh, qualitative data analysis, grounded theory, and, and you derive conclusions. But with 804 interviews, that's obviously impossible. I should also add that we had 38 uh, 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 well, members of the consortium or researchers uh, ranging from junior researchers to very experienced researchers. So how do you organize this? Uh, and then on top of that, it was a study that had to be organized very fast in a very turbulent environment, so the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, we tend to forget fast, but I remember vividly that, that, that society was in the grip of sheer panic not just society, also policymakers, politicians, uh, newspapers, uh, people. So all these things added up. And that's how, that's actually a, a, a summary of the birth of our project. And in this paper, we, we reflect on that. We reflect on it in the sense of what did the, what, what do these origins mean for the, design and organization of the project and um, and we come up with a number of insights that we think might be helpful for other researchers that want to engage in a large scale uh, comparative multi-country project and um, what would your advice be to our fellow researchers who might want to embark on similarly large uh, international comparative research. Yeah, well, first of all, I think um, what we do in the paper is we, we emphasize the interpretive nature of uh, uh, comparative research. And you, know, you have read the handbooks, I've read the handbooks, it's all about uh, 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 MS, the visit the... Uh, uh, most more similar system design or more different system. systems design. And that's important work and important results have come from it. Uh, but it usually it's the kind of result where you have a variable, let's say, um, uh, proneness to revolution. And then you, you, you know, that's the dependent variable. And you have a, since the independent variable then varies on a number of dimensions, uh, let's say, a youth bulge in the country or not and uh, so and but apart from that um, which feels a bit in itself already feels a bit reductionist in our situation 
apart from that, we, we simply didn't have the time to set up a, a research design that way, you know, where you, 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 you uh, delineate the variables, identify the variables, you operationalize them carefully, you figure out, how to, you know, by figuring out how to measure them, then you go to these countries and measure them and, and so on and so on. We, we didn't have the time. So we moreover, because we also, we not only wanted to start fast, but we also wanted to contribute something to, we wanted to, to generate knowledge that was useful for policymakers and for ordinary people so they could make sense out of the chaos uh, swirling around them. And um, so we settled on qualitative research and, um, and but not only that, we began to feel once we were in the project that comparison is something that is not interestingly not so much thought about in comparative research. Actually, there's a couple of authors who who who, who confirm that, and uh, one of them, David Nelkin, uh, wrote a little book about it even. And and just to give you a simple example that I was involved in, I was involved in a multi-country study, several multi-country studies of prostitution policy. And we sat down once with David and he said, yeah, well, this whole idea of policy, you know, that's not the same in different countries. So policy in the UK is something we were, we were having this meeting in the UK is something very, very different from policy in Italy, because in Italy, all policy is politics. And I added, yeah, and it's very different also in the Netherlands, where it is much more mixed in with administration, and the term is bestuur, and it has no beginning and no end. There is no program. You know? And uh, so when you compare policies in different European countries, what are you comparing? And that's one of the big problems with all comparative research, that we assume a lot about our countries. We assume similarity, or we assume difference. Uh, you know, um, even if the linguistic term is the same, it doesn't mean that the underlying entity or reality is the same, or the meaning that people attach to the to the words. So, um, so we have an interesting section. I think it is interesting in the paper where we argue that all comparison is uh, is is interpretive. The hot core of comparison is is interpretation, and what you do when you compare is you. You, 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 you set up a situation where you can make more interesting comparisons because you have a larger range of situations that, 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 uh, that help you to situate an event that you don't understand in a particular environment. That's, that's what interpretation is, understanding situations by situating them in a larger environment and vice versa. So... Um, and for us, that was an important insight because qualitative research in uh, political science in particular and in comp comparative political science is not, uh, well, how do you put it, not looked upon so positively usually. And uh, so that, that's one thing. The other thing we learned is... Uh, is that that the beginning, which was for us as chaotic as any for anybody, there was actually a kind of logic, you know, although it felt like we were flying on a wing in a prayer, um, there was a logic to it. And, the, and, we, and that logic is the logic of uh, pragmatism. I'm not saying that we had a blueprint for pragmatist research, and, and we don't develop one in the paper. In fact, I think it's... Uh, an, an, an oxymoron to think that there are some, that there would be a blueprint for 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 pragmatist research, but but at some point it became clear to us that first of all that we had to act to get it going. We had to act. First, we started with three countries, and then uh, sort of mid March, and then through a snowball effect, as it were, suddenly we had nine countries who wanted to participate and, 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 and 38 researchers. So you need to do something. So we very quickly set up these flexible organizational structures, a kind of matrix organization. And, uh, but but what, we've, what we, in the, we, we discovered what we were doing in the process of doing it. And that's a basic pragmatist principle 
meaning is discovered through action and not in timeless knowledge foundations prior to action. And that's what happened with us. And, uh, and then we built upon that. So that was one. It's also what we discovered was always forward looking. It was, well, it had to be practical. And, uh, and sometimes we rejected things, we made mistakes. So for example, we argue in the paper that uh, in the end, we, we, when we started coding, we did it a way that we were all taught coding, initial coding, right? You, 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 you uh, Kathy Harmas, the you know, phenomenal book she writes, she, she, she admonishes us to do line by line coding or, or, or information snippet by information snippet. So that's what we did. And we, we had a coding scheme of 93 codes. And then we had to do tagging I and mean, we didn't have 800 interviews yet, but we still we definitely had over 100 or more. And that was a, an impossible job. You don't need 93 codes to do the tagging, you know, which is organizing the data snippets of all those interviews in, 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 in stable categories. You, know, we, you can do it much less because later you, when you have a question, and you start to inter interpolate your data with your question, then you, you take one of those codes and you go through all the data and then you can do, again, you can do detailed coding. But we didn't know that, you know, we, were, we were discovering it. It wasn't wasted time at all. We, we, we got to know our interviews very, very well and it helped us to, to, to navigate our data. But, um, but it's all based on uh, this, in another uh, pragmatist uh, principle is that, uh, uh, that on experience, not experience in the sense that we have done this so often, as clearly we didn't, but the kind of life experience we bring to it. And that was central in, in the project. So with 38 people, everybody has different experiences. So some of us were very, very good at uh, uh, computer assistant uh, 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 data analysis um, and uh, so I didn't know anything about computer assistant data qualitative data analysis but I learned from them and it, it, it was very important that they kept us honest they kept us on the rails but again others were much more conceptually uh, inclined and so they kept asking the bigger questions about the data and uh, uh, so um, I think that was important. Um, um, and uh, pragmatism is all about uh, collaboration. Huh? So it's, it's, uh, that's, of course, what, what, it, what this project was all about. So I can go on, but that was the pragmatist part. Um, um, yeah, the, and maybe the third element was uh, that to be discovered is if you don't do those those formal ex ante research designs, what, what is it that you do? And what we discovered is that you can do, you can think of design as a form of problem solving, and we call it generative organization. There is a kind of continuity between how the project is organized and the design of the project. And it means that you can make changes along the way. So, in, in, uh, you know, you can, you can make changes because the situation changes. So in the beginning, it was all about contact tracing. Well, we don't do that anymore, I guess. So now it's then, it, you know, vaccination was the big issue. And our design allowed us to, to change the question uh, because we had the data. We could interrogate the data on the basis of the codes. We could add questions to our interviews. We did three rounds of interviews in total. And um, uh, and and then we could we could look at vaccination in different countries. Um, so generative organization is a I think a nice um, flexible way of organizing large scale projects. Now why is that important? And we also discussed that in the paper because in the let's say the the political economy of the of the of the contemporary university it's all about big million dollar uh, consortia research consortia right S stretching out over different countries so uh, when when i was still uh, uh, at at sheffield university that's all that was the name of the game you know if you didn't bring a big multi million dollar project 
in, then uh, you had problems uh, with your career at some point, even if you were the most cited uh, uh, scholar in, 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 the, in your department. So, but those big multi-million dollar consortia tend to become very yeah, uh, formalized and 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 uh, and so now we I think we we give a model we provide a model where you can do this in a much more uh, interesting flexible and fun way because I should also emphasize and I, this is a personal note but uh, that this is I never had so much pleasure in working on a on a big research project as with Solpan it was really incredibly enjoyable it was enjoyable to work with smart early career researchers and see how they took leadership roles how they developed ideas for publications they of course we shared everything um and and how they how they you know became the drivers of publications so if you look at our publication list you will see lots and lots of early career researchers who who you know have published a number of papers in leading journals or, or because of the of the project why was this possible because the 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 the, the project was organized as a research commons and so a commons is a bottom up type of organization where everybody participates uh, well basically voluntarily and uh, which we all did we in that um, and um, where everybody owns all the elements of the research process. So if you go to the website of Solpan, you can see the, the interview schedule is available. It's, it's also in the paper uh, or the reference to it. The coding manual is available. Uh, what I found particularly interesting was that we had a a kind of bulletin board where people posted ideas for publications and then you could tag your name to it and uh, at some point you had a little group and you started working on the publication and uh, and it was all on eye level you know it was it was a peer governed you know in a true sense of the word and it was it there was a genuine uh reciprocal uh trust and respect for, among the among the, the 38 uh, uh, participants so yeah maybe if i pick on, on this question um of comparison first because i thought yeah. that was really interesting you know when i remember when we first started talking about the paper and we realized very quickly also in going back to the literature and i mean you and i are comparative um, scholars as many um other of our colleagues in sultan also we quickly realized that even though so many scholars do it and so many studies do it or claim to do it, there's actually very little theory out there or explanation out there. What actually does it mean if we engage in this comparative um, process? And I think what really struck me in that is, you know, we compare all the time in our everyday lives. It's, so, it's something that I think is is core to to us as humans and then also, of course by extension to us as you know in the in the scholarly world and and yet you know we we found it difficult to to kind of reflect upon what it actually means and i think this you know this paper has been um two years in in the making and to see that we were actually able to now describe it you know as you said in terms of this interpretation but also really in, in my sense and in, in my head it's also still about attaching meaning to something you know you can't understand what is happening in one country without looking at another. You might then in the specific paper not label it as, you know, in comparison to this country, we see this, but but as a scholar, as in terms of thinking process, you you inevitably do it and you make sense because you you see the data, you talk to your colleagues about the data, you know, which also many of our Sultan exchanges was about comparing the the different data between us, you know, um, between the country teams. And that's how you make sense of your own data. And then you go write your paper and have your ideas um, with the country teams, for example, if it's a paper just on your own country. And I thought that was really interesting because again, this, what for me is very characteristic of Solpan and the research common, what you said, you know, we have this, this intricate way, weave almost, but of doing something in the scholarly world, but then at the same time, you know, doing it also as, as humans that we all are and as comparing it and 
you know, when we draw um, in this parallel paper that we've got on democratic research, we say, you know, exactly that, that so much of course was about the research, but it was also about how you work together across disciplines, across countries, how do you compare, how do you collaborate? Um, and um, yeah, I think that that question of comparison was, was core um, to that, not just yeah. in terms of our intellectual thinking, but also collaborative working. Yeah. No, I can't put it any better. I can only add that for many people who are raised in a more positivist, uh, uh, how do you put it, uh, research tradition, um, their fear is that, that that qualitative research and qualitative comparative research is only uh, sort of comparing anecdotes, right? And it, 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 it's, there's, it's not systematic, it's not rigorous. And I think what we show in, in our project is it's a very rigorous process. So interpretation, interpretive research can be just as rigorous as you know any research with with with, with numbers. Exactly. And I think that um, you know, just to add to that, um, also this idea that um, qualitative data can also be timely. Um, it can be rigor rigorous and it can be timely. And you know, yeah. that's the other thing that often gets questions in, you know, because people say oh it takes ages to to analyze qualitative data and of course it takes a fair amount of time but as you're engaging um in this analysis you can already draw as you said yeah. preliminary conclusions you can reflect you can adapt your research questions especially on something um such as a health crisis and and that's what we did and i think it's fair to say um in all the the country teams um there was pretty much I think no country team that wasn't featured in some form of media outlet no, during that time yeah. you know clearly yeah. showing that it was timely it was policy relevant yeah. what we were doing yeah. um and you know now we you know we have the time um also to to look at it and in, in, in a bit more depth but this all happened as we started analyzing already um yeah and so this is uh, this is also what we describe in in, in this paper um great I think we've covered all the questions, unless yeah. you want to okay. add anything. Uh, yeah, one more thing. This was not an easy paper to get published. And I don't mean this in a critical sense at all. Uh, one reason is that we had two reviewers who both give extensive comments on, on the various versions, but pulled in different directions. So one reviewer said, uh, uh, well, uh, the paper should be more philosophical. <laughs> And the other said, "No, it should be. Uh, you should be. You should describe in much more detail what your instruments are." But I think both reviewers, in a, in in their own way, were right about what we had to do in this paper because you can make a philosophical case, if but if you can't show it, you can just tell it. Right? It's just it's much less convincing than what we have now because now we have, on the one hand, a philosophical argument. This is you know a pragmatist form of research where we all even develop a research commons by the way that's described in a separate paper also published in social science and medicine um, which I, I very much recommend but but in the second half of the paper we show you almost you know step by step what we have done and I think so taken together that makes for a much more convincing argument so I'm really grateful to both reviewers that they stayed with us and with the editors that they stayed with us and gave us the opportunity to develop the paper from a mildly interesting description of large-scale research to what I think is now an exciting uh, argument about uh, a particular mode of research, uh, large-scale, multi-country, qualitative, comparative research. Mm -hmm. What would your message be to early career researchers such as myself who are trying to navigate this sometimes challenging task of, you know, providing, as you said, you know, such rigorous um, research, so so ticking certain boxes, but at the same time, not being afraid of pragmatism in the research mm -hmm. area. So, um, but of course, funders, unfortunately, or as I said, you know, we're just lucky with reviewers or editors, you know, who are as helpful in this process. Um, what would your message be to your early career research? And yeah, um, I think finding the right journal is very, very important. And, and uh, social science and medicine, qualitative research in health turns out to be an excellent journal for 
this kind of work. Uh, there are more papers uh, published on pragmatism. It, it wasn't easy, but they're there. And now they're coupled with ours. Uh, they published the paper on the research commons. So there is an interest in, 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 in taking on papers that have innovative messages, innovative methods also. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so um, within, the, within departments, um, it can be messy, it can be tricky. Uh, uh, I mean, I had a big ERC project rejected by one reviewer who didn't know the difference between qualitative and quantitative uh, samples. And uh, so, you know, that was bad luck. Uh, and that can happen all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to continue doing this. You know, I hope that that both the, the, the two papers and the results, if you go to the website of Solpan, you will see that there are now 22 papers published in and many of them in, in high impact journals. Um, and a lot are still in the pipeline. Uh, we're working on a, another one that's uh, probably, yeah, well, we're working on many papers, but uh, so th there's, th there, there's still, we haven't squeezed all the juice out of this, the, these, these, uh, these oranges, as it were. And uh, so, uh, and maybe just get started. That's what we did. You know, I know not everybody has to, is in the same luxury position as some of the senior researchers were. And we took advantage of a very specific moment in time. There were more people. We wrote another little paper, Barbara, Breinzak and I, on uh, Sprouts, uh, which, which, which was a, a, an acronym for projects that spring up in, in times of crisis. Yes, but uh, be creative, be courageous, um, um, and see where there are possibilities, and, and see if you can get the support of senior researchers who often have more resources or more, more clout. Um, yeah. That's 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 what I have to say about it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that's a yeah. I think that's a good point. And just um yeah, maybe also yeah, being creative and this idea of you know as as so many spaces were closing down in the beginning of the pandemic, unexpected places and spaces were opening up. So opening using up. that yeah, using yeah. that as an analogy um also in terms of our our research for the future. You know, just because yeah. one space is closing down, or you might get a rejection doesn't mean your research is, is bad. It just means, you know, you might have yeah. to look for other spaces to, um, to, yeah, to get that research out. 